Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Pete Musto. John Russell, and Brian Lynn. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, here is Pete Musto. Stone tools found in a Mexican cave suggest people were living in North America as early as 26,500 years ago, much earlier than past research has shown. Scientists recently reported they had found 1,930 limestone tools in a mountain cave in Mexico's north central Zacatecas state. The discovery included small flakes and fine blades that may have been used for cutting meat. Small points were also found that could have been used as spear tips for hunting. Ciprian Adelian is an archaeologist at the Autonomous University of Zacatecas. He is the lead writer of a study on the findings that appeared in the publication Nature. Ardelean told the Reuters news agency the tools were between 31,000 and 12,500 years old. Traveling groups of hunter gatherers lived in the area off and on for thousands of years. Ardelean said it is possible some of the objects were even older than 30,000 years. But so far, the evidence is not strong enough to support that claim. Also, his team was unable to recover any genetic material from the cave. The peopling of America was a complex and diverse process, he told Reuters about the findings. Tom Dillahay is a professor of anthropology at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. He was not involved in the study. He told the Associated Press that currently the most widely accepted dates for the earliest known humans in North America are between 15,000 and 17,000 years ago. Dillahay said the proposed date for the objects may be correct if further studies can confirm the results. However, he said he thinks they are probably not more than 20,000 years old, and most likely are between 15,000 and 18,000 years old. Dillahay does not question that some of the objects are probably man made. But he said he would like to see further evidence of human use of the cave, such as cut bones and burned plant based food remains. Ruth Grunn is a professor of anthropology at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. In a nature commentary, She said the results should bring new consideration to six Brazilian sites proposed to be older than 20,000 years. Those age estimates are now commonly disputed or simply ignored by most archaeologists as being much too old to be real, Grun wrote. Another study is also providing new evidence that modern humans may have arrived in North America much sooner. That study centered on evidence of human presence at 42 sites around North America, as well as the position of a land bridge that connected Siberia to Alaska. I'm Pete Mosto.
since humans invented shoes or underwear, has a single item of clothing become so common in such a short amount of time? From Melbourne to Mexico City, Beijing to Bordeaux, many people can be seen wearing this piece of clothing, the face mask. But rarely, maybe never, has anything else worn by humans created such widespread debate. Jeremy Howard is the co-founder of Masks for All, a group supporting face mask use for everyone. Speaking recently about masks, Howard said there has probably never been such a quick and dramatic change in worldwide human behavior. Yet not everyone is accepting of this safety measure, which health officials say is aimed at reducing the spread of the coronavirus. Plenty of people do not like being told what to do. Many also do not trust scientific evidence suggesting that masks can be an effective way to reduce new infections. At demonstrations in the United States, Canada, and Britain, people have criticized face masks. At one recent protest in London, a person argued against mask-wearing requirements in stores, saying, People die every year. This is nothing new. Mohammed Aburji, a 42-year-old government worker in Lebanon, shared his thoughts on wearing masks with the Associated Press. He said he walks to work without a mask and does not worry. There is no coronavirus, brother. They're just deceiving people. As of July 24th, Lebanon had reported over 3,400 coronavirus infections and 46 deaths. Officials have made public appeals for people to keep wearing masks and to practice social distancing. In Mexico City, Estima Mendoza says she feels shock and fear when seeing people not wearing masks. I feel defenseless. On one hand, I judge them, and on the other, I ask myself, why, Mendoza said. As human beings, we always judge. In France, masks resulted in an unexpected benefit for Maria Dabo. She no longer feels so different in a country that has made laws to prevent Muslim women from wearing face coverings. I feel like we are a bit better understood, Dabo said. Everyone is obliged to do the same as us, which makes me believe that God is busy teaching people a lesson, that covering up isn't religious or anything else. It's about not being a fool and protecting oneself. I'm John Russell. Researchers are testing a fungus known to grow in high radiation environments to see if it could possibly protect humans traveling in space. One fungus being studied survived, even thrived, in areas around the former Chernobyl nuclear power center in Ukraine. In 1986, a reactor there exploded and caught fire, sending huge amounts of radiation into the air. Chernobyl was the world's worst nuclear disaster. The accident caused widespread harm to people and other living things in the surrounding area. Several kinds of fungi, however, have continued to experience growth within the highly radioactive environment. Researchers are studying a substance found within some fungi called melanin. 
it is a pigment that gives skin, hair, and eyes their color. Studies have shown that melanin in the cell walls of some fungi can take in radiation and turn it into chemical energy. Recently, a report about one kind of melanin-containing fungus was published on the Internet in preprint form. This means the research has yet to complete a peer review process. The study is a project of scientists from the University of North Carolina and California's Stanford University. The scientists reported that the fungus, called Cladosporium ferrospermum, was sent to the International Space Station, ISS, for testing. Earth's atmosphere and magnetic shield protect us from extreme radiation found throughout the universe. But the U.S. Space Agency, NASA, notes that while the ISS sits within Earth's magnetic field, astronauts receive over ten times the radiation that we receive on Earth. It warns that space travelers spending long periods in places like the Moon or Mars will face high levels of harmful radiation. The researchers say the melanin-containing fungus that thrives in Chernobyl could be used to create protective shields for future astronauts. In the report, the researchers said growth of the fungus on the ISS was observed for 30 days. Radiation levels were also measured. During the test period, the measured radiation levels decreased by at least 1.82% and potentially up to 5.04%, the report said. The researchers said that the experiment demonstrated that the fungus not only adapts to, but thrives on and shields against space radiation. They noted that since the fungus reproduces itself in high-radiation environments, small amounts could be transported to space and then grown in large amounts. Further testing is planned with similar fungi. Last year, researchers from Johns Hopkins University said they had shipped melanin from a similar fungus called Cryptococcus neoformans to the ISS. This fungus lives in environments across the world and was found thriving in the area around Chernobyl. One of the researchers on that project is Hadameus J.B. Cordero with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Cordero said in a statement that the goal of the ISS research is to see how melanin from the fungus can protect astronauts and equipment in space. But he added that radiation is also a big concern for healthcare providers and patients who are exposed to the material during medical treatments. If you have a material that can act as a shield against radiation, it could not only protect people and structures in space, but also have very real benefits for people here on Earth, he said. I'm Brian Lynn. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Gerald Ford. Ford was the 38th president, but he was never elected to the position. Instead, an unusual series of events brought him there. 
Many historians have described Ford as a good man facing a difficult situation. He tried to fix a troubled economy, end United States involvement in Vietnam, and show people that the U.S. government could continue to operate after a crisis. Critics from the two main political parties had problems with Ford's efforts, and voters did not elect him president when they had the chance in 1976. But he is remembered in American history for making many voters feel better about their elected officials. When he was born, the future president was given his father's name, Leslie Lynch King. But the boy's father was abusive. His mother separated from him a short time after their son was born. She asked a court for permission to cancel their marriage. Her request was quickly approved. She and the boy moved from the Midwestern state of Nebraska to Michigan. In a few years, the mother married a man named Gerald Ford. The couple had three sons together. The new family was warm and loving. In time, the oldest boy officially took his stepfather's name and became Gerald Rudolph Ford, Jr. He was called Jerry for short. Growing up, Jerry Ford was a well-liked person and a good student. He was also a top football player. He was named the most valuable player on his team at the University of Michigan. After finishing college, he was offered work with professional football teams. But Ford wanted to continue his education instead. He accepted coaching positions for the football and boxing teams at Yale University in Connecticut. In time, he attended the law school there. Ford's path to politics was similar to that of other presidents during that period. He worked at a law office in his home state. He fought in World War II. He married. Ford's wife was Elizabeth Bloomer. Her friends called her Betty. She had been a dancer and worked as a fashion model. The Fords went on to have four children. When Gerald Ford was 35 years old, he launched his political career. The Republican Party chose him as its candidate for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. Ford was elected to represent his home area of Grand Rapids, Michigan. But unlike many other politicians, he did not move on to the Senate or become governor of a state. Instead, he stayed in the House of Representatives for 25 years. The job of congressman was, in many ways, a good choice for Ford. He was well-liked by many voters and other lawmakers. He could help different groups come to agreement. He took increasingly important positions on political issues and in time became the top person in his party in the House. Ford was a strong supporter of Republican presidents. In the 1968 election, Ford advocated for Richard Nixon. Ford liked Nixon's plans for the United States, as well as his efforts to improve relations with China and the Soviet Union. Both Ford and Nixon were re-elected to their positions in 1972. But by then, major problems had come to light in Nixon's administration. One problem in the early 1970s related to Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew. Agnew had been vice president since 1969. Five years later, officials found evidence that he had accepted money from contractors, both while Maryland's governor, 
and as vice president. In answer, Agnew resigned from the presidency. Normally, voters elect a vice president, along with a president, every four years. But by coincidence, the U.S. Constitution had recently been updated to say what happens if the country needs a vice president unexpectedly. It states that the president has to nominate someone for the position. Then, a majority of lawmakers in Congress must agree. So, in 1973, Nixon nominated Gerald Ford to take Agnew's position. Nixon was not especially close to Ford, but he knew a majority of lawmakers would likely accept him as vice president. They did. However, Ford did not serve in the position long. In eight months, another unexpected event put him in the Oval Office. In August 1974, President Richard Nixon resigned from office. He was the first president to do so. As a result, the vice president, Gerald Ford, became president. Ford was sworn in as president on August 9, 1974. Then he spoke to the nation on television. He said, My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. He told people, Our Constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not men. The public had understandably lost a good deal of faith in government officials, and especially in Richard Nixon. Ford wanted to reestablish their trust. But a few weeks after taking office, Ford used his presidential powers to pardon Nixon. The pardon meant that Nixon would never face a criminal trial or, if found guilty, punishment for his actions. Ford said he believed pardoning Nixon would help Americans begin to recover from their painful experience with the former president. But instead, the move angered many people. They believed that Nixon should be held responsible. They also lost some of their trust in Ford. In addition to these political troubles, Ford faced other difficult issues. The American economy was struggling. His administration had to deal with unemployment, inflation, and the lasting effects of an energy crisis. The high price of oil imports came at a time when Americans were using more and more gasoline. Ford took steps aimed at improving the economy, but critics said he was not consistent. Some criticized him for increasing government spending and cutting taxes. Others criticized him for reducing government spending and raising taxes. Ford also oversaw the withdrawal of Americans from Vietnam. An earlier agreement had brought a ceasefire to groups in South Vietnam, North Vietnam, and communist forces. The U.S. officially withdrew its combat troops in 1973, but the fighting restarted. Ford asked Congress to approve military and humanitarian aid for the area, but U.S. lawmakers did not approve the full amount, and in time they cut military aid. In 1975, communist forces began to take control of Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam. Ford ordered all remaining Americans in the country to leave, along with any South Vietnamese who were connected to the United States. He said that, as far as Americans were concerned, the Vietnam War was finished. 
Americans did not appear to blame Ford for the troubling end of the country's involvement in Vietnam. And some recognized that the country's economic and energy problems had started long before he became president. But in general, Ford did not have the support of Congress, and many voters did not forgive him for pardoning Nixon. In 1976, Ford officially campaigned for president for the first time. He won his party's nomination in a close race against Ronald Reagan, the former governor of California. But he lost the general election to the Democratic candidate, who said one of his best qualities was that he did not have experience in the federal government. The argument appeared persuasive to many voters, who still did not appear to be enthusiastic about the government. In the 1976 election, nearly half of all people who were legally able to vote chose not to. Ford left the presidency graciously. He said that, because he had not planned to be president, he was thankful for the unexpected opportunity. Although Ford said he was ready to retire from politics, he continued to be active in public life. He advised others on government affairs, published books, and sat on boards and committees. His wife, Betty Ford, also left a lasting effect on the public. As First Lady, she had spoken about her experience with breast cancer. After her husband left the presidency, she also spoke openly about her battle with alcohol and drug abuse. In 1982, Betty Ford co-founded the Betty Ford Center in California to help people get treatment for drug addiction. She announced her husband's death in 2006. Gerald Ford died of heart disease at the age of 93. By that time, most of the public had accepted that one of Ford's biggest achievements was to help the country recover after Nixon resigned. President Bill Clinton gave Ford a Presidential Medal of Freedom for his efforts. And even Jimmy Carter, who beat Ford in the 1976 presidential election, began his inauguration speech by thanking Ford Carter said, For myself and for our nation, I want to thank my predecessor for all he has done to heal our land. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.